Welcome to the fourth lecture in, these, in this series on net zero. And this one's about agriculture. Uh, in most debates about climate change, uh, and in particular about climate change mitigation, people spend all their time talking about electricity and the energy sector and the oil companies and so on. And uh, they might get beyond that to transport, which is, the, which is what was covered in the uh, previous lecture. But normally they don't get as far as agriculture. And this is a huge mistake because uh, if you can't crack climate change without doing energy and you can't claim, uh, crack climate change without doing transport, agriculture is absolutely central. Uh, and it's, in some sense, much more complicated than the other bits and pieces. We know what the technology is for the internal combustion engine, we know what a battery is for a car, and we know what a wind turbine and a solar panel looks like. But when it comes to agriculture, it's much more diffuse in its characteristics. Location really matters, but it is at least 10% of the emissions uh, here in the UK, and globally, it's about 25%. So it's about as important as transport. And when we say it's only 10% in, in Britain, that's probably because we don't measure it properly. So the emissions from soils and from peat bogs and so on are probably not, properly ca are probably not captured uh, as well as they should be in the statistics. So if it says it's 10, have in mind at least 15, and it wouldn't surprise me at all if actual emissions uh, indirectly as well as directly affected by agriculture turn out to be much closer to double uh, the recorded numbers. So this is big ticket stuff and um, the sorts of pollution that comes from uh, agriculture is both direct and indirect. There's pollution uh, in the direct production of foods, animals and so on and there's pollution in the inputs that go into agriculture. So it's not just uh, whether methane comes from uh, cows burping, uh, sheep and so on. It's not just uh, emissions given off uh, from uh, the harvesting of particular kinds of crops and so on. It's also what it takes to produce those crops and those animals in the first place. And this is about the really core natural capital uh, that agriculture relies upon, it's about soils and the way in which we use soils to produce those outcomes. Now, soil is an enormously large carbon sink. There's a huge amount of carbon in our soils, and the amount of carbon in our soils is vital not just from a carbon perspective, but also from a biodiversity perspective. Roughly, and it's very rough, uh, a very rough estimate, but basically biodiversity in the soils and carbon content are pretty closely correlated. And just bear in mind, and this may not immediately strike you, most biodiversity is beneath your feet, not in the visible stuff that you can see above the ground. Now, what we've been doing in agriculture particularly in this country, but in the developed world, uh, and we're beginning to do it in developing countries, is strip the carbon out of the soil through intensive production. You might occasionally see dramatic headlines, like, you know, 10 years left for the UK soils. It's the sort of thing that uh, uh, makes the farming press and occasionally spills out into the national broadsheets. But if you look at some of the intensive cereal lands, uh, the continuous monocultures and the chemical intensive farming that goes with it has drastically reduced those uh, uh, carbon stocks. But it's not just, you know, conventional soils that have been losing the carbon. Think of the fens. The fens are essentially peat, which is highly concentrated carbon. And as the wind blows the soil away, in the Fenlands of East Anglia and up into Lincolnshire, uh, that's just carbon going away and eventually into the atmosphere. And it's a disaster from a climate change perspective, and actually it's a pretty big disaster as I come on into the next, next lecture a bit for the environment more generally.
and then there's the peat bogs. You know, peat is an enormous store of carbon. Just think about it as you know the equivalent of a coal mine, a peat deposit full of carbon, and that locks up uh, a potentially incredibly dangerous source of future emissions. And if you put a load of sheep on the top and they overgraze intensively uh, that peat bog, then it'll stop forming. In fact, it'll start emitting. And uh, of all the things you might do in the natural environment, in the land use, to deal with climate change, you probably start with peat bogs. Now, I labour these points because it's really important to see where agriculture touches uh, the carbon gain. But now I mentioned inputs. Okay, so farming is not about lots of farmers. In fact, there's hardly any left now. And indeed, in, in the UK and indeed in America, there are nearly all 60 or over. At least that's the average. So you can work out beyond that how old some farmers are. But there's not many farmers. Most of it is tractors, fertilisers and pesticides. That's essentially how modern farming works. And when you think about these, you have to remember the point about carbon consumption versus carbon production. Almost all the main inputs into agriculture in this country come from abroad. Fertilisers, pesticides, tractors, and indeed quite a lot of fossil fuels too, are all imported. And this is where the trade dimension of climate change becomes critical. Farmers in this country are, of course, screaming about Brexit and being exposed to WTO rules and free trade agreements and the fear, probably justified, that when it comes to trade agreements with countries like the United States, the farmers' interest will probably be sacrificed for the manufacturing interest and British farming will be exposed. And what's that mean? Well, it means that the true carbon footprint of agriculture and the food we purchase is not just the air miles that go into flying your uh, uh, French beans from Kenya or your asparagus tips from Peru. It's also the energy intensive fossil fuel components of making all that fertilizer, pesticides, herbicides, etc. And above all, those tractors and farm machinery and combine harvesters and slurry spreaders and all the paraphernalia of modern farming, which again comes, from, comes in large measure through imports. So if you want to have net zero domestically and you want to have a proper balance of agriculture, you have to have an adjustment for the carbon price at the border. So that's the inputs. Now, what would you do about agriculture in a net zero world? What would it look like? Well, uh, 101 Economics tells you that what you need is a common carbon price as part of the application of the polluter pays principle. This is pollution. By the way, there are lots of other pollutions from agriculture too. And an efficient market is one that internalizes those pollutants into costs and therefore prices. And the agricultural sector should pay its share for the damage that's caused for making the emissions on our behalf as us, the consumers. And that price will eventually pass through to us. And yes, it means that food will be more expensive, but yes, we are uh, um, over-polluting and therefore over-consuming uh, beyond that level which is consistent with net zero. So you'd have a carbon price. You'd have a common carbon price. And you'd apply that to agriculture. Now, for many in the agricultural sector, this is kind of, you know, big threat, you know, shouldn't you subsidise us, we're farmers, um, uh, for reducing carbon emissions rather than make us pay for the pollution we're caused? After all, farmers expect to be subsidised for everything else, from cattle that die from T, uh, TB through to planting hedgerows or uh, doing a whole host of things which we might want them to do. They expect subsidies, and they're a heavily subsidised industry, and they demand subsidies for uh, reducing carbon too. This is nonsense. And the most uh, gross form of subsidy that's taking place is so-called red diesel. You know, farmers pay for half the price that you and I pay for our diesel, which might go in our vehicle. 
because they're given subsidised red diesel. And it's called red diesel because it's, it's dyed red so that in theory you can detect when someone's driven a vehicle onto the normal roads for normal private means full of uh, cheap subsidised uh, uh, diesel. That'll have to go in any reasonable uh, net zero world. And so that's a challenge and farmers will pay a lot more for fertiliser and they'll pay more for pesticides. You know, organic food, food that doesn't require these chemical inputs, will become cheaper relative to the chemical, chemically produced for heavy fertiliser, heavy intensive production. And that's good. It just tells you that the reason you can buy a very uh, cheap loaf of bread and why you can buy a very cheap chicken is precisely because you are, by your purchase, polluting our environment for the way these things are produced and you're not paying the consequences. And remember, just because you don't pay the consequence of the pollution doesn't make it go away. It's just a burden to someone else instead. So we'll have to do that and it will have implications for uh, food prices and it will require that any trade deal and any imports of food itself, and after all we import 40% of our food, and the inputs to farming, all of those will have to pay the same carbon price, the same polluter pays charge at the border. Otherwise, we're just subsidising other people to pollute and have an unfair competitive advantage against British farmers who will be uh, rightly subject to the net zero requirements. So that's the way this goes. Now, you, if you're a farmer, you might be thinking, oh my God, this is just terrible. We're already up against the wall. Uh, many farmers are uh, only just making ends meet. They only make ends meet by the scale of the subsidy. Remember, British farming only produces about 9 billion of output. That's 0.7% of GDP. And for that 9 billion, 3 billion is direct subsidies. Uh, and then there's the pollution that's escaped, the special tax concessions, the red diesel, the exemption from inheritance tax, the exemption from rates, and so on and so forth. You know, agriculture is not a big business, and making polluters pay, you might think, is an enormous uh, threat. Well, there is a silver lining here, and it's a huge one for the farming sector. Because farming doesn't just cause emissions and pollution, the land is also utterly vital to sequestrating carbon and taking it bad out, back out of the atmosphere. Agriculture is a potential really big source for what I call natural sequestration. We hear a lot about CCS and piping the gas back to empty oil and gas fields offshore as what you might call industrial sequestration. But nature does a huge amount of this for us. And the two big things that count are soils and trees. And already the Climate Change Committee has suggested, and I think it's a pretty crude estimate and open to all sorts of challenge, but it kind of gives you a, a marker that 20% of agricultural land should be reforested for net zero. Well, if you're a farmer and you're going to be paid the carbon price, because of course you're doing negative emissions by sequestration, this is a substantial revenue stream that might be available and a potential good use for land. And particularly for that marginal land currently covered in sheep and upland cattle, which is in any, in any event barely economic and certainly not economic without the subsidies it already uh, has. So natural sequestration through trees and tree planting, and of course, sequestration, natural sequestration back into the soils. And I envisage a substantial market where there's a carbon price that buyers of uh, sequestration offsets, those difficult to reach decarbonisation areas, uh, pay for the planting of trees and for better soil practices. And that seems to me to be a really quite attractive option for especially marginal agricultural land. And uh, you can see how uh, in principle that works. You'd have a natural capital baseline survey of the assets. You'd look to what enhancements in terms of trees and soils might mean. You'd re-estimate the baseline. The difference between the two would be the value of the carbon saved, and then you would sell that carbon on into carbon markets. 
great business opportunity, great potential, essential if we are to have net zero. But you might smell a rat here. How exactly is this going to work? How do we know that just because you buy an offset for carbon and you're told that someone's going to plant some trees, that those trees are actually going to do uh, uh, what's on the label on the tin? In other words, they're actually going to take up the carbon that they're projected to do. Some trees die, some trees get stunted, weather conditions will change over the next 40 years, not least because of climate change. How do you know it's going to be delivered? So the really interesting stuff in this area is all about how to have a creditable, uh, believable, justifiable, deliverable carbon sequestration and not just hypothecated promises. And you know the international natural sequestration carbon uh, credit offset market is riddled with corruption and examples where what was promised on the tin was not delivered. So I see here uh, proper trust funds to ring fence the funding for the maintenance of woodland and soil practices. I see independent accreditation. I see uh, natural capital asset surveys using satellite data, uh, ground data, etc. That's all part of it. The second rat you might smell here is that supposing you're, in inverted commas, one of the good guys, you're running a farm which is already looking after the soil. Maybe it's organic, maybe it's pastures for life. You're doing the right thing and your soil is already saturated in carbon. You're not where, the place where we're going to sequestrate more carbon because you've done it already. Are you going to get the benefit of that sequestration or is it all going to go to people who've trashed the land so that it's relatively easy to add back carbon from really depleted soils. And here I think that uh, there's a significant role for thinking about how to underpin the agricultural best practices which are already in place and support those, and indeed through subsidies, as well as pay farmers with depleted lands to make the investments to put the carbon back in the soil. So great opportunities. Now another opportunity is biocrops and the idea and biomass and the idea that we could use uh, land, agricultural land, to raise energy crops and then turn those energy crops into usable electricity in particular, but also biofuels, ethanol and so on. In theory, you can see how it works. Uh, natural sequestration takes place. The crop grows in the field. You cut it down, you burn it, and it's carbon neutral because you're putting back the carbon uh, that you took out uh, that the, the natural process took out of the atmosphere uh, and off you go. And it could have been better because you could then use CCS to sequestrate the emissions that come from burning the biomass in plants and of course you can take the methane gas off the anaerobic digestion which is using waste product on farms. And some of that waste product, in fact quite a bit of it, turns out to be new plant uh, crops like corn and so on. Theory sounds fine. In practice, uh, it's a very different story. Biocrops are very low density energy sources. You need a hell of a lot of willow and a lot of macanthus grass to make up uh, uh, enough electricity to produce uh, the sorts of uh, outputs we need. And if you look at the true carbon cycle of what's really going on in these biocrops, it doesn't look at all carbon neutral. What about the uh, chemicals and so on that are used on the crops? What about the way the soil is stripped back uh, in order to grow these crops? What about the machinery? Since, since it's low density, bulky stuff, the harvesting machinery, the trucks, the tractors, the vehicles, and what about all that stuff that takes place to get these bulky things all the way to the power station? And most extreme examples uh, you know, taking wood from somewhere in the southern part of the United States, turning it into wood pellets. You imagine the energy required to do that, drying the wood pellets, taking them to the coast, shipping them across the Atlantic, bringing them ashore, and then taking them to old coal power stations and essentially sticking them in large log-burning stoves.
It doesn't take a lot of common sense to realise this really isn't the way we're going to do decarbonisation. So yes, there's a role for biocrops and biofuels, and yes, they have uh, an important part, particularly in transport, for uh, the transitions. But when it's palm oil and sugar cane and uh, wood that's being used, think at least twice and actually think three times this doesn't stack up, and especially when the palm oil's grown in what was previously rainforest. So we need to take all of these factors in account to transform our agriculture and our land use. And we have to do that in a way which takes account of all the other environmental things which agriculture is involved in. The biodiversity, in particular the drastic loss of you know, farmland birds, catastrophic falls in insect life, the recreational possibilities, the physical health, the mental health, the water services that are provided. Oh, and then there's the other emissions which damage air quality like ammonia, uh, as well as all these carbon uh, and climate change related ones. And so in order to do agriculture, and indeed in order to do all of these decarbonisations, we need a comprehensive environmental policy framework within which the decarbonisation, the net zero is set rather than simply pursue net zero to the, uh, as a silo policy, regardless of the consequences elsewhere. And in the fifth lecture, which I'll come to next, uh, we're going to look at how uh, an overall environmental policy framework, and indeed a 25-year environment plan in the uh, British case, is the way in which to embed decarbonisation in this wider context. Thank you.